Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for June the 11th, 2020. This is episode number 10. Today, among other things, we'll be talking about the Nikola Badger electric pickup reveal date has been announced, uh, Tesla CEO Elon Musk's memos about the Model Y and Semi production have leaked, and the Ford Escape a plug-in, a plug-in hybrid has its price and range revealed. I'm Dominic Ioni, Inside EV's editor and Inside EV's forum moderator. Uh, joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, EV advocate, multiple EV owner, and Inside EV's editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on your, all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. And he also puts together the super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Uh, go and subscribe and tap that notifications bell. Um, usually, we, are, we will be streaming live on YouTube. We are in the doghouse at the moment, but we will be back. But um, you can leave questions and comments on the YouTube channel and we'll get to them. And you can also go to the uh, Inside EVs forum. We have a a, a thread for the podcast. Uh, so welcome gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. Uh, lots to talk about today, but uh, before we get to the big news, uh, what do we have charging up in our driveways this week? I think um, let's start with Kyle. You have, uh, you. I'm not sure if you have anything in your driveway, but well, you want a story. You, you, <laughs> you, you want a virtual drive. You want to tell right, us about but- that? Well, yeah, that and, and I do have something cool in the driveway that's not uh, a plug-in electric vehicle, but it does charge from the sun, which is kind of cool. Yeah. It's the 2020 Hyundai Sonata with the solar roof option. And I thought this was cool, and I basically parked it outside as much as I could to see how much energy it could gain. Um, and from what I gathered was it was only counting up the energy when the car was on. There's like a little calculator in the screen that says, here's how much you've generated. And so... Th- with my week with it, um, it only generated about three kilowatt hour, which is better than nothing. Uh, but I asked Hyundai about it. I sent them a message. I said, you know, does this thing charge? And they said, yes, uh, but it will prioritize 12 volt battery topping up and then it will divert to the high voltage battery once that's topped up. So it could just be that there's enough drain on the 12 volt where it didn't ever get to the high voltage battery. It's only 204 watt peak something like that, 204, 207, not much. Uh, but still, if it, it sits outside all day, that's energy is energy, may as well have it. The weight penalty, they said, was minimal. So I thought that, that was cool. That's that's the hybrid, right? That is the hybrid yeah. Sonata, I guess. And then right. my story with the Sonata is, it was supposed to go back yesterday. I'm getting another car that's not a plug-in today or yesterday. Uh, but I was leaving to go to this event that I'll talk about in a second. And I put all my stuff in the trunk, my laptop, my filming gear, and then, you know, the key was in like my box of stuff and I closed the trunk and it just locked all the doors and there was no way to get it out. I mean, the whole, everything was locked. There's no button on the outside of the car to open the trunk. So I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? All my stuff's in there. So we kind of improvised. I took the I3 on a seven hour journey yesterday to Charlotte and back, which is Ooh. always interesting in an I3. And <laughs> I was running late. So it was a lot of, uh, we definitely pushed that car hard. Anyway, they uh, their Hyundai is going to figure it out, but they couldn't remotely unlock it because I wasn't the authorized user of the vehicle, and you know it was just a pain in the butt. But I showed up to Ford's Performance Technological Center, Ford Performance's Tech Center. I forget the exact name, but basically their R and D facility for go fast Fords, and this is Ford GT, GT three hundred and fifty, GT five hundred, Focus RS. And uh, now the Mach-E and, of course, all of their racing programs in the U.S. So it's all NASCAR based. And uh, they're right uh, right outside of Charlotte in Concord, North Carolina, which is like home of NASCAR, home of racing. And uh, they're literally right next to NASCAR's R&D facility. It's really cool, um, but it's very quiet from the street. Like you'd have no idea driving past this place of what it is. So we pull in a lot of cool Fords in the in the parking lot and uh, – the whole point of yesterday was to be able to be the first one outside of the company to experience Mach-E behind the wheel, which was awesome. Uh, but it wasn't in an actual vehicle. It was in a simulator. And part of the day as well was to experience their simulation technology and how virtual vehicle development can speed up the time of engineering and developing a car, but also lower cost and improve quality and you know all the, the normal talking points. 
So um, yeah, I spent a lot of time with Team Edison uh, yesterday, which was really great. Met uh, pretty much everyone involved in Maki, and um, it was a wild experience for sure. Car is really good. Keep your eye on motor1.com and insideevs.com for the exclusive first reporting on that. We were literally the only ones there. It was wild. So this is like a little pod that you get in and it's on like a, so it moves around when you're steering and you have like a, can you tell us a little bit about the setup there? Yeah, I'm pulling up a picture now for our, our audience on YouTube. And um, let me see if I can make the phone. So essentially what it is, it's like a, 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 a tub on a moving uh, platform that has a Shelby GT500 interior inside of it. So you get in, it feels like you're sitting in a real car. Uh, there's another picture I took. So um, this one right here. I mean, if you were just waking up and saw this, you would have no... Right. You would have no idea that you were in a normal car or a simulator. Uh, it, it was really cool. So you, you sit in this car. They first put me in a sports car to become acclimated. And, uh, you know, it was a Ford sports car. And then they put me in a Ford pickup truck that was just a general pickup truck, but fully loaded. So I was able to feel the difference and get an idea of how cars that I'm familiar with would drive inside the sim. Thanks for pulling that up, uh, Martin. And, um, yeah, so so got a good feel of the sim. What's what translates to real world? What's a little bit artificial? Then they put me in the Mach E, and um, you know I'll save most of my impressions, my detailed driving reviews, and things like that for Motor One and Inside EVs written pieces. But uh, I will say it's a huge emphasis on performance. Like I was expecting much more of an SUV wallowing feel, uh, but that right. was not the case. It was very sprightly. The acceleration was incredible, and I was just driving the dual motor, all wheel drive version, not the GT. And yeah, it was it was really good. Chassis balance was great, very neutral. You could make the car understeer or oversteer depending on inputs. That's really special to have in a car. You only achieve that with a really nice weight distribution, low center of gravity. I was impressed. And you could get all that feedback from inside that thing. Yeah, so the only the the two uh, uh, real senses you could not get out of the sim was hard acceleration. You kind of got jolted back for a second, and the thing points up at the sky, you know, because uh, it's all moving around. But you don't get the constant G load of acceleration. So that was uh, you're just watching the numbers sort of go up on the dashboard, and braking made me sick. <laughs> so I had to close my my eyes every time I hit the brakes, uh, so I didn't get nauseous. And those were the two that I couldn't get. It also, you know, the stability control systems were off. ABS was off. Uh, it did not uh, do that. It was more about here's the general feel of Maki, -E. but uh, it, a lot of the chassis, the suspension, the the turn in, the handling of the car will translate to real world. And they they claim that they're able to do ninety percent of their engineering work on here before they even produce one singular component of the vehicle. Right. Yeah, I, I uh, actually saw this, not exactly this setup, but with the same kind of curved screen and and the platform, but without the pod, it was the steering wheels. They had a, the, an office in Silicon Valley a few years ago. I'm, I'm not sure if they still have it. But uh, so how uh, how realistic was that screen? Like it wraps around, you, it shows like a road in front of you. When I saw it, it was still kind of, mm, you know, 64-bit or maybe 128-bit like Nintendo style. How, how realistic of a, of a view did they show you? Well, I think that's probably what made me nauseous. I think the the visuals weren't, you know, obviously it's not meant to be the, the a visual simulator. It's more of a, a driving feel and, and data gathering sim. So I think that uh, mm -hmm. would take me a little while to get used to. I, there was definitely a, you know, it, it didn't look like real life, but it okay. felt like real life. Um, so do you, so looking at the screen there, do you step over that uh, that that side there's not like a door to open so you sort of clamber in but then does that shut down on top of you so it feels like you're in you are in a mackey yeah exactly and and i don't think i have the photos on my phone we have them on our actual cameras but um the interior is out of a gt500 so the interior is not a, a mackey interior but uh, it does feel like you're in an actual car i mean if you were to close that and get into the real world you pretty much have the same viewpoint same dash the air conditioning worked like everything worked all the buttons on the wheel paddle shifters for the gas cars i mean it was pretty incredible do you wear and, like he headphones or is there speakers what's the noise like 
yeah, you, you put these really good noise canceling headphones on all of the sound is piped into the control room behind the simulator. And so I can have communications with the team, uh, talk to them about what I'm feeling. They can say, Hey, why don't you try this and try that? And I can say, okay, here's what I like. Then at the end, we did some really cool, um, work because, uh, I got a general idea of what Mach-E would drive. Like I said, all right, now show me what, like if you were to make a Ford performance Mach-E, like a Mach-E GT 500, what would that feel like? And, uh, they had some cool stuff that they were working on and it was a big difference instantly. They just push a button and then boom, you're in a totally different car and you can feel it right away. It was, it was wild. That's crazy. It's worth noting too, that the, uh, the Mustang Mach-E will be the second quickest Mustang they have. I believe it, the GT 500 is, is the top of top of the Mustangs. So it just comes right under the GT 500, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. For their, their, their big push was on look at the acceleration and I wasn't even in the GT. Uh, and you know, I, I, again, I don't know for sure how much of this truly translates to real world uh, because I'm not able to drive the car on the pavement. Uh, but every engineer was like, look, we use this thing legitimately as many hours of the day as possible to make a real production car. And if they're using mm -hmm. this to make a car that moves on the pavement uh, based on what they're telling me and my seat of the pants feel, is that it is a very accurate, accurate uh, uh, engine that runs the the simulation. So I, I thought it was cool. It was a really cool experience, at least. And, and this is like a, I have to remember too. It's a, a, a crossover. It's not a sports car. I mean, it it's gonna have it's gonna be a very sporty crossover, but it's still like a crossover. It's still like you know you're sitting high and. Yeah, well, that's the thing. They're sort of like, uh, you know, for a lot of Mustang fans, people in the Mustang family, they buy a Mustang. They either have kids or need to leave the brand for whatever reason, right? right. And then they're driving something else that's not fun. It doesn't mean anything to them. Now they're able to keep the Mustang brand throughout the stages of their life, uh, put all their stuff in there, put the family in there. It could even be a daily driver for a GT500 owner. Uh, right. right. This is a, a, a likely scenario for a lot of people. And they said that, you know, they did a lot of market research and found that there was something like 58 competitors in the small CUV segment that will be electrified within the next five or six years. Or I forget the exact terms, but it was close to 60 different cars that they're going to yeah. have to compete with. So for them, it's all about performance, enthusiasm, building a car that people will want to drive, not just let's make another boring you know, in their case, it would be like an escape hybrid. This is not that, or escape, uh, sorry, uh, battery electric vehicle. This is not that at all. Right. They got a lot of pushback about how it using the Mustang name and uh, they st they're still getting, you know, a lot of pushback. It's pretty controversial, but I think once people start driving it and realize how, how you know, performance oriented it is, I think um, some of that at least will go away. There'll, there'll always be people that hate the idea of having a, a crossover Mustang, but you know, yeah, I agree. I, I definitely push them on the question on video as well. So you'll see some of their official responses to this, which I thought was really interesting. But they're like, look, we realize it. we have a core group of enthusiasts that are not going to love that. But sure. the overall population are going to love driving a Mustang again with their family, with their friends, with their dog, with their bike in the back. Sure. Right? So it, it's uh, definitely a larger audience, I think, is going to be OK and excited with it. And honestly, it drives like a performance SUV thing. I mean, I would say it felt uh, just as nimble as Model Y, for example, which I think is really the benchmark for a performance handling SUV. And I did a whole track review on that car here right, right behind me. And uh, Mach-E felt, uh, in the simulator at least, more composed, more compliant, which means it's a little softer, which is good because the Model Y is a little stiff in the performance mode. But the steering was just the, the big takeaway uh, from what I got in the sim. It was incredible uh, steering ratio, feel, uh, grip level seemed to be really good. And what I drove was production spec. It would be interesting to compare that with the Taycan or Taycan uh, steering feel. Once you get, hopefully you'll be getting one of those in a few weeks or so. Yeah, yeah. we're working with Porsche on some exciting stuff on our side here. So stay tuned because we're going to do some track things with Taycan that no one's done before. What's the, uh, just to quickly ask about, um, I don't know how much you can talk about this, whether you had to sign your life away with um agreements and things but what was the general vibe around their electric 
uh, project when you were filming that stuff with Ford this week then? Were they, uh, you know, sort of rah, 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 cheerleader, everything's great, everything's wonderful? Did they, were they saying, well, you know, we're, we're playing catch up? Or what was the, the general vibe and how did they talk about their electric programs at Ford? Yeah, this is a, one of the main things I wanted to gauge when I was there because, of course, this is a large automaker. And essentially, the team that I was on, uh, my impression is they seem to operate independent from the rest of Ford. They went and said, look, we need to make electric cars that are good, that are not compliance vehicles. And, you know, they're like, look, we got into fights and board meetings. Like, people didn't want to do this. People hated the idea took a long time, but then eventually Team Edison basically came up and they were just able to go on their own. Audi's piloting a similar project, so we'll see how that goes with a team focused just on making good electric vehicles. But in Ford's case, these guys are like, look, we, um, you know, I met with the director of icons for Ford, for example. So he's responsible for Ford GT, GT350, Focus RS, uh, their Le Mans cars, their uh, GT500, it's like everything cool. And he's like, the Mach-E is going to be the most exciting Mustang ever. And so this is an exciting, uh, exciting time. Everyone there was very passionate about Mustang Mach-E and surprisingly, very passionate about F-150 battery electric vehicle, which I'm excited about. And uh, they said, like, your mind's just going to be blown when you see this thing. So I thought that was cool. But the overall vibe was like, we love electric cars. We want to make a good EV. We're here to put our best foot forward. They're thinking about this from a holistic perspective. Now, whether or not this will translate into the vehicle, we'll see. But we're talking real-time charging status into vehicles, which is something only Teslas can do right now, where when you pull to a charging station, you know how many people are there, how many stations are out of order, you plug in with VIN recognition, and you're good to go. Like That is the key, I think, to unlocking other vehicles going mainstream. Because right now, if like I had the i3 yesterday, right? I had to pull up 40 apps on my phone, make sure my credit cards were up to date on them, find which one could Put out, you know, I'll put 50 kilowatt. What's a 24 kilowatt one at a Harley dealer that may not even charge the car, for example. Right. The Mach-E is just going to do all of that for you like a Tesla does for its vertically integrated network. So they, they had a big focus on integration, also a big focus on uh, driver assistance systems and over-the-air updates. Uh, they'll be able to update functionality of the Mach-E, which we already knew, um, but we're talking on an every modular, uh, every module level. Uh, some cars like Volkswagen Audi Group products, for example, they're like, yeah, we can over the air update. But what they can over the air update is the screen <laughs> on their right. car. They can't update anything else without plugging in. Ford will be able to do that. And you won't have to schedule an update time, which I thought was interesting. It will just happen in the background while driving. Oh, nice. Kyle, one of the things I want to point out, what you mentioned about the Mustang being able to just plug in and recognize the vehicle um, that's not going to be a unique Ford feature. I know I'm, I know you know that. I, I don't know if all the, the viewers do. Um, that's the plug-in charge technology, which um, Ford's going to be one of the first vehicles to launch with that. Audi also is uh, going to have that, I believe, in their e-trons before the year's end. So I'm pretty sure the Mustang and the e-tron are going to be the first two vehicles to, to, to offer that. But that's going to come across all the brands within the next couple of years all the major OEMs are going to have that technology built into the cars and it's going, all the cars are going to act like Tesla's basically where you pull up to a charging station, regardless of the network, you just plug the vehicle in and it recognizes the car, it charges your account and it's a seamless transaction. So I think that's going to be a huge step forward. You mentioned about what a pain it was to drive the I3 where you're pulling out apps and trying to figure out, do I ha am I a member of this network and that network? Uh, that's going to go away in the next couple of years, which um, is pretty exciting. I'm, I'm going to be going down to uh, Electrify America's headquarters in the next couple months and uh, uh, having access to their plug and charge technology. We're going to do some videos, going to do a deep dive on what they're doing and how they're going to be bringing that to market within a couple of months. So uh, look forward to seeing that. Yeah, that's awesome. I think it's called Hubjet, right? That's the company that's uh, doing the transaction for VIN recognition. I forget the exact IEEE code, but it's a long one. Um, but yeah, like you mentioned, I think you know, they're, they'll probably start with their partner brand. So it'll be Porsche, Audi, Ford, uh, Harley Davidson, whoever's worked as part of an Electrify America agreement uh, right. will probably work on that first. Just would make sense, especially Volkswagen Audi Group because they're under the all the same umbrella. So 
Yeah, and I'm excited for that. And Ford, Ford is kind of partnered with Volkswagen to some extent. They're going to be building Fords on the Volkswagen MEB platform. So it's, it'll be cool to see some uh, cooperation in the charging area as well. So speaking of charging, Tom, you had a chance to spend some time at the Tesla V3 supercharger this week. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I have a, a long-range uh, Model 3, and we got a first open uh, V3 supercharger in New Jersey down in Maple Shade. Now, it's a, it's a good drive from my house. It's uh, 70 or 80, maybe 90 miles uh, from my house, and I, I wanted to, uh, to, to test it out and film it and see just how fast the car will charge on that. So I figured why as well do knock off two birds with one stone. And Kyle and I have been uh, tag teaming on a, uh, a series of 70 mile range tests on electric vehicles for inside EVs. We're building up a category and we're going to be testing all of the uh, EVs that we can get at a constant 70 miles an hour to test their range. So we can then compare them uh, to each other under the same conditions. So I figured I might as well do the range test on the Model 3 and then do the V3 supercharging which I did and knocked off both at once. Um, as far as the range test goes, uh, at a constant 70 miles an hour, I clocked in just a tick under 290 miles. It was like 281 point something miles. And I still could have probably driven a couple more miles, but uh, it's pretty good at, uh, at a constant 70 miles an hour. I averaged uh, 4.25 miles per kilowatt hour. Um, and that's the best that I've managed so far at a constant 70 miles an hour as a comparison Kyle and I both did the uh, Chevy Bolt EV and Hyundai Kona, or, or the Chevy Bolt EV. And I did the Nissan Leaf. He did the Hyundai Kona. On the two cars I tested, we averaged uh, 3.4 miles per kilowatt hour. I think the Kona, if I'm correct, Kyle, did slightly better, like 3.6, something like that. Uh, but uh, in any event, much less than what the Model 3 was able to, to do. Uh, and then I was able to perfectly time the range test where I just hit zero as I was pulling into the V3 supercharger, plugged in, recorded all that, and it's crazy fast. Uh, I was able to charge to 80% in 28 minutes, uh, but the car does obviously, like all EVs, slow down the higher the state of charge. The incredible thing was I charged to 50% in 13 minutes. That's just nuts, right? Um, I mean... You walk, you plug in, you walk inside the convenience store, you get a cup of coffee, use the restroom, come out, and you're 50% charged, plenty of range probably to get you to the next supercharger or to your destination. That's, so, that's, like, uh, that's like 140, 150 miles, right? In 15 in 30, minutes? Yeah, in under 15 minutes. So, you know, I mean, I, I know it's not uh, get gas speed, you know, that's it's not uh, 300 miles in five minutes. But it's, it, it, it's so close now. I mean, we're closing that gap so much that it's really making long-distance travel not just possible. That's been possible for a while. It's making it convenient. It, it, there's very little inconvenience now with some of these the newer EVs and these higher charging rates. The Porsche Taycan, for instance, while it's not as efficient as the, uh, as the Model 3, uh, I was able to charge on that at an Ionity station in Germany, and it went from zero to 80% in 23 minutes, uh, you know, five minutes faster than the, the Model 3. Now, the Model 3 can drive a lot further on an 80% charge than the Taycan. So you could make the argument that the Model 3 charges faster because you're really mostly concerned about how far you can go versus how the time it takes to charge. But still, you know, 80% charged in, in 23 minutes, 80% charged in 28 minutes. We're now really closing the gap on refueling and uh, making long distance travel in electric vehicles seamless. Tom, I have a question about your charging experience at V3. I've done quite a few V3 sessions now recently. And um, either I have had issues where the station will not connect to the car where it uh, faults out when it starts pulling high power. I did a whole video on this. I was at the new uh, Las Vegas version three, you know, with all the million solar panels and all the cool stuff. And I literally couldn't charge there at all. I plugged my car in and it would go and a charging error. I tried every single one, went to the old version two down the street, charged perfectly fine. Uh, so that was whenever I was doing more than 170 kilowatt, everyone else there was having the same problem. Uh, the other question I had and, 
uh, this is the more important one, I would think, because I think most of those concerns are done because I've had a couple V3s that have worked since then, is I have noticed the charging curve on Model 3 change based on the state of charge that I plug in with. For example, when I plug in at 0%, the thing will ramp up to 250 kilowatt, let's just say at 19%. But if I plug in at 11, it won't ramp up to 250 kilowatt till like 24%. And now, you know, I would think that this has a lot to do with thermals, battery packs, heated enough. It probably needs to be at 40 C in order to accept max amps. But at the same time, I've, you know, I've tried to eliminate all of those variables and it very much seems to give you full power only for a short period of time based on when you plug in. Did you maintain 250 kilowatt to like 30% or was it tapered by the time you hit 30? So interesting thing was that, that it was almost identical to the Tycon's um, charging curve uh, up to the point where it starts to taper down. The Tycon started tapering down at, which went up to 270 kilowatts, but started tapering down at 25 minutes. While I was doing the Model 3 test, it reached, um, I plugged in at 0%, it reached uh, 250 kilowatts at 5%, and it started ramping down at 24%. So it was yeah. only Martin, about- Can you go back to the beginning of that clip? Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's that's let's actually it's because it's, you, Tommy, you've done this uh, as you should do in uh, and and you've you've sped it up. But uh, if we can go sort of just talk us through, you have sped the video up, but talk us through it. So it's zero, it's one, it's two, yeah. three, four, it's, five, and you hit five. maximum speed now. Two fifty. Now watch when it gets to twenty four percent, it it starts to uh, there we right there it starts to to trickle down a little bit. So now when we get up to forty uh, percent, it's it's still over a hundred kilowatts. I think uh, I think over fifty percent it gets down to one hundred and twenty. Uh, let's see if we're moving forward. Yeah, still charging at one hundred and twenty kilowatts in at fifty percent, and now it's gonna after sixty percent or so. I think it drops down to under uh, right there. Sixty yeah, yeah. percent it drops down. So I mean, you know, this is look. It's under twenty minutes, and I'm at sixty eight percent. Um, that's just, you know, that's yeah. fine. Unplug and leave. You know, you don't, <laughs> most people on superchargers and DC fast chargers really don't stay much, much longer than 60, 70% at the most 80%. Um, I have, um, a, an interesting observation here, just looking at this for the yeah. first time, which is, uh, you maintain 250 kilowatt peak, which is amazing. They definitely have changed the charge curves recently because I haven't been to a V3 in the last month or so. So I'm glad you did this test. Um, but above 32 or 34%, whatever it is, it's identical to a version two. And, and what I mean by that also is these charging curves have gotten extremely conservative in the mid pack range. For example, like if we look at my old charging curves from a two years ago on model three long range, it used to rip 150 kilowatt to like 47, 48% on a version two. And now we're down to 130 at 25%. Uh, I'm not quite sure why they're being so convert conservative when they're just dumping all of the amps in there down low. And now what I'd be curious to try out is let's plug in at 30%, right? And see if we can get 250 kilowatt up there. Uh, right. Cause I think there might be some logic to their charging curve. I'll, I'll have to try that out. I can say I did this twice actually, and I got the same results both times. Um, unfortunately, the reason why I did it twice was I drove down a week earlier just to record a, a V3 supercharging session. I had everything set up and turned everything on. And a, like two or three minutes into it, my my phone shut off because I was out of uh, storage. So it shut off the uh, recording. But I I was watching it as it was going. And, uh, you know, I, I sat there for and I actually charged to 100 percent because I wanted to do a zero to 100 percent. So I know how long that takes. Um, you saw it take 28 minutes to go from zero to 80%. It took another 34 minutes to go from 80 to 100% because it was an hour and two minutes total from zero to 100. Unfortunately, if you don't have the film, it didn't happen. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I didn't get the recording, but I did watch it. And uh, it had the same charging uh, curve as the one that I show here recorded. And it was a a week apart in different temperature. It was even a, a cooler that day. So, um, you know, but I did start at zero. You want me to start at a higher state of charge. And yeah, like 25%. Point. Yeah, yeah I'd like you to start right off. when that tapers, whatever that number is. I think you said 24%. 
like try to get yeah it's plugging at like 20 or something like this see and if it has it's a nice and toasty stuff. battery pack and yeah. see mm-hmm. if it tapers early because that if if it does continue charging at a high peak for longer which i actually think there's another bit of logic in this charge curve that says you know that 34 percent big dip down to 130 kilowatt i think that's the overlying logic but i'd like to see if you can extend that 250 a little bit longer mm-hmm. Makes the, sense. Uh, the- Headline for the headline for me here is this this slide that you uh, that you put on screen there, Tom, in your video. Like this is just a just I don't think I think we forget sometimes how far we've come. Th- you've timed this at thirteen minutes, mm-hmm. and you've taken thirty six kilowatt hours, and your battery's half full. I've spent thirteen minutes at a charger trying to open an app or get it to register my credit card. Uh, you know, in the past, and in thirteen minutes, you're done. Like if you need. If that's all you need, you're gone. Like yeah. that is that. Uh, it, what stood out to me is just how quickly. If you want to, sp- not even splash and dash. If you want to get 50, 60, 70 percent of your battery full, it's so quick. It's so quick. And we should almost be trying to encourage people. For, just forget, forget the last twenty percent. Just always think eighty because that's yeah. so quick. Like that just blew. When I watched this a couple of days ago, blew my mind. Like we just take it for granted now. Yeah, what most people should do is just charge with just enough to make it to your destination with a buffer that you're comfortable with, right? Don't pull me and pulling at 1% all the time. But, you know, give yourself a 5 or 8% buffer, and, but don't spend more time at a DC charger. One, it's probably costing you a lot of money. Two, it's blocking the chargers for other people to use. And, uh, and, and three, if you can slow charge your car, it's better for it in the first place and saves you time. So the goal is to spend the least amount of time at a DC charger and the most amount of time with wheels turning on the road. That's right. <laughs> so let's get to some news. So this week, it's pretty a uh, big week. Um, and I think our top story is uh, the Nikola Badger electric slash hydrogen pickup truck reservations are set to open on June the 29th. Um, let's see that uh, the company Nikola, they have a transport truck, they have a, a wave runner, they have an off-road vehicle, and now they're going to have this pickup truck. So they, they've introduced a lot of products, and uh, we're going to see the actual, you know, original first prototype of this uh, just in a couple of weeks on June 29th. And that's at, uh, what do they call it, the big event they have lined up called Nikola World 2020. They had an event like this last year as well, I believe, where they had the, the um, electric and hydrogen-powered uh, semi-trucks. But yeah, so they're going to show this pickup truck, and they also say they have a battery. They're going to show off it's like 500 uh, watt hours per kilogram, which is crazy energy dense. I mean, that's uh, so. If you look at batteries today, uh, a Tesla battery, Panasonic battery, can probably hold what 280 watt hours per kilogram. But I think that's. that's approximate density so this is like almost a third more than that so and that i guess technology will be in in the badger pickup truck so this truck has a range of they say 600 miles it'll go 300 miles on on its battery but then it also has uh, i think 13 kilograms or something like that of uh, hydrogen with which it can go another 300 miles so we haven't seen the price for this yet so we can see it up on the screen here. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can you can see it there. But we also have it on Inside EVs. And, and we, actually, while I'm here, uh, I should mention that we have a Nikola section now, a subsection on the Inside EV, EVs forum. So if you're a fan of the company, you know, come come drop by and start a thread. And, and uh, if you have a reservation, or if you're getting one uh, at this event, you you'll be able to actually get a res- get a pre-order or do a reservation at the event um come uh, leave us your reservation number and we can search maybe tracking how many reservations they get for it it's a um, yeah we have so we haven't seen a price yet but um i'm, I'm a little worried because they have like this whole electric drivetrain which is already expensive but then you're adding a whole fuel cell component to that as well so you have the storage tank and then you have the whole you know fuel cell with the membrane on top of all that so I'm thinking it reminds me of uh, people always would say, why, why, why don't we have like diesel plug-in hybrids because it takes advantage of like a, the efficiency of the diesel motor plus the, you know, the electric drivetrain. But the thing is, diesel engines are really expensive. So when you put that together in one package, you know, it just makes a lot more sense 
to use a gasoline engine because it's it's more affordable. And you know, if you have a big enough battery, you're not you're not using the, that part of the powertrain so much anyway. So yeah, any any thoughts on this, uh, Tom? So you know, it's a cool. It, it, it's the most normal looking, if you want to call it normal, of the of the new wave of electric pickup trucks that we've seen so far. Um, uh, it, that's positives. There's negatives to that. Like you take, for instance, it doesn't have that uh, um, pass through storage area that the Rivian has. I'm assuming probably because of the fact that uh, that's the hydrogen tank is probably somewhere back there. So you lose some of the advantages of having a dedicated electric powertrain uh, that you would have, say, in, in, in a Rivian where you can come up with some unique features. Um, you know, I, we, I, I know the hydrogen works. We, we all know that companies can build hydrogen cars and they work. I just still can't understand how we're going to build out hydrogen infrastructure. You know, the, the whole fact of having uh, a secondary fuel supply, let's say, on a truck like this where it's part battery, um, but then if your battery runs out, you can refuel it quickly uh, and continue driving. Um, that would be why you would want to have a plug-in hybrid because the battery it can't go far enough or it can't charge quick enough. So, so that's the, set, the use of having this secondary fuel or power source. But it doesn't work if there's no refueling stations. You know, uh, gasoline works as a plug-in hybrid because there's gas stations everywhere and diesel, and you can get that fuel quickly if you if there's no charging station or, or 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 you don't have time to charge even though we're showing now that that time is becoming irrelevant um if you know where are these hydrogen fuel stations going to be we they've been promising us that we're going to be getting them in, in in new jersey for years toyota was going to have i think six or eight of them when they first announced the mirai a few years ago i was at the auto show i talked to the toyota rep yeah, New York, New Jersey, we're going to have eight stations in a year and a half. That was like three or four years ago. N nothing that we don't have one yet, you know, and, um, you know, pickup trucks, you know, are, bi are, are big everywhere. But you think about them really being big in the Midwest and in, in more rural areas. We're not going to have hydrogen fueling stations in these rural areas. We can't even get them built out on the coasts. So, you know, I, I don't know where they're going with that. Um, but, uh, hey, you know, more more power to them, decent looking truck. And, um, you know, the more the merrier, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking them. I'm just, I don't understand how it'll work. Yeah, it's still pretty early days. They, they did, uh, there was, we had a news story about them earlier in the week. They, they brought, they, uh, they bought a whole pile of uh, a number of uh, hydrogen producing things that they're going to have a different, um, like refueling stops for their, for their, um, transport trucks which so i guess that would help pick up truck owners somewhat but mm -hmm. yeah it still seems we we don't even have good coverage of well i mean we have thousands of chargers out there but there's still people that complain about the coverage of, of our charging infrastructure and there's you know still some way to build that out so it and these hydrogen facilities are super expensive to set up so yeah it's it's kind of hard to see but you know let them i guess let them do their thing and you know mm -hmm. it, My Sorry, Outside of California, I don't know if there's a single public hydrogen refueling station in the country. There, there wasn't as of like last year. So, you know, uh, yeah. Do you, you want to drive way out on, onto the interstate to a truck stop to to refuel your 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 pickup truck? I, you know, like I said, I'm not hating on it. If 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 somehow somebody showed us me a path to building out this infrastructure and it worked, okay. But I just I don't see a path to ever having um, that for, you know, uh, light duty vehicles. Right. I agree. I, I think hydrogen for light duty vehicles, I'm not a fan of. Uh, certainly vehicles that go back to a centralized hub for refueling or for long haul, uh, you know, spaced out stops. I guess I could see it. But also battery electric technology is coming along really well. Um, I think Nicola's uh, whole thing here, based on my conversations with them briefly at CES this year, was we want to build trucks, pick up trucks, whatever. They just want to build all their cool stuff, but also be an energy provider of hydrogen fuel. So I think that's going to be an interesting play for them um, because now they get to fuel not just their own vehicles, but other vehicles that are supposedly going to be hydrogen if it ever 
comes to fruition. So yeah, I think that's a, a huge thing for them. We'll see if that plays out. There's been plenty over the years that have talked up hydrogen as a future. And uh, the concern, I think, recently is more and more are now saying we're going to keep this on the back burner. Um, and there was the, uh, the 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 Daimler case recently with uh, Mercedes Benz and their uh, GLC F cell, um, and uh, more and more uh, Toyota being an exception because uh, they're 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 super into their hydrogen. So whereas a lot of car companies have been talking it up until recently. It seems the last couple of months, more and more of them have said, this is a technology that at some point in the future, it may work. And we've got R&D going on. We're going to keep that bubbling away. But for the next 10 or 15 years, it's EVs. And then, obviously, as I mentioned, you know, Toyota are, are convinced that that is the way, that's the way forward. And now Nikola have come in with the with the big hydrogen banging banging of the drum. And I just, it's so fabulously expensive to build that infrastructure it's 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 inconceivable that any private company is gonna fund this nicola certainly haven't got the money um to to do it and to, to build out the stations themselves in a way that tesla have a supercharging network so who's going to do it that's a you know here in here in uh, in Europe I guess in the US as well you know Electrify America is finally you know a big name a big network and here we've got things like Ionity but for a long time it was the Tesla supercharging network and lots of little others because nobody wanted to put that money in to building out a a charging network for cars and that's with electricity which with respect is everywhere i know i'm being a little flippant here because you know the grid connections that you need for evs aren't everywhere but it, the, the, you know the, in principle we are all surrounded by the lights are on right with electricity we're all either heated or cooled and lit by electrons who is going to pay for this hydrogen network around the world i just there's not an obvious business case to me but again I want to be supportive of everyone who's trying to move us into a, a better future. So I don't want to talk them down. Right. Well, I think if, if you have an interest in, in Nikola and what they're doing with hydrogen, I would suggest uh, he was on the uh, the founder and uh, former CEO. Now he's the uh, executive chairman, Trevor Milton. He was on AutoLine uh, Daily After Hours uh, yesterday uh, with the regular hosts, and they had Sebastian Blanco on there as well. And you know, he went through a lot of their business plan. I haven't watched the whole clip yet, but it is on the Inside EVs forum in the new Nikola section. There's a, a thread, and you can find the video in there. If you check that out, spend like an hour or whatever watching that, and you'll you'll get up to speed on the whole plan. And you'll see he's very enthusiastic, and he has a lot of confidence in this in pulling this off. So, yeah, we'll we'll have to see. Um, there's certainly, they've just went sort of public uh, recently on, on the NASDAQ, their IPO, their N, NKLA, I believe. And they were like coming along around 30, mid $30 range. And then they, they peaked after they announced this uh, pickup truck reveal coming up on the 29th at uh, Nikola World. Uh, it, it jumped all the way up to like $92 and it sold down, back down again. It's up around, I think, $65 this morning. But anyway, let's move on. Um, so, Tesla, uh, Elon Musk memos have leaked as usual. I've never, never seen so many of them. I get it. I think those that leak needs some air quotes. So the uh, Model Y, he says, is their top priority, and there are some production and supply chain ramp challenges. So they're not building them as quickly as they want to, I guess. So that was kind of interesting. And the other big news, a separate memo is that the Tesla Semi got the green light for production. And I think news of that Semi came out right around the same time as some Nikola news. So it, some people were saying that that memo leaks because of the Nikola, the excitement around it that caused their stock to pop. And actually, and we'll get to that too a little bit later, and uh, Tesla stock is doing actually pretty well itself. But that's kind of exciting. We've... we've uh, been waiting for news about the semi for quite some time and now it looks like they've got a production ready thing they're kind of ready to go and they have they're going to build the the memo says they're going to build the motors and the batteries are going to be made at the uh, 
the Gigafactory in Nevada, but that the actual vehicle itself will be made in another state. And as we, we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, that will be either uh, Austin, Texas area, or possibly Tulsa, Oklahoma. Kyle, you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I've been waiting since 2017 to convert a semi into a motorhome so I can cruise across the U.S. and finally grow my YouTube channel road trip series. And I cannot wait for the day to do that. Uh, no, seriously, I think the semi is going to be a incredible thing. You know, they already said they're in limited production now. As far as we're aware, aren't there only three in existence? You have the silver one, the matte black one that turned into that red one they just repainted it right. and i believe maybe it was just two maybe there's one more uh so i'm not quite sure what that means if it's in limited production unless they're stuffing them in a field somewhere in austin uh but as far as we know if they're going to be built in another state uh we have not heard of semis in limited production in another area up to this point so what is elon talking about i have no clue uh i, I hope that he says, you know, I hope what he means is correct, that we'll get semi soon. But Martin, have you heard anything? You're up to date with stuff. I haven't. It's it's one of those ones that it started on the internet as a screenshot of an email sent to everybody. Like the subject line was everybody. And uh, it looked like a real email. But one of those things that when it starts on the internet, just be careful. But presuming that everything that we saw was real in it and i know elon has since chipped in on on twitter on various conversations of people posting the screenshot of that we know the tesla semi is going to be used by the company themselves to begin with to iron out the kinks and actually to to get cars in and out of factories and move things around and and they've talked before about the uh, if they had their time again, they wouldn't have something in Nevada and something in California, and they have to constantly drive between the two. So we know they're going to use Tesla Semi um, for that, but there's been no others, as you say, Kyle. There's been, and I forget there's three. I just think there's two, but there are. And uh, well, they 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 did a rewrap of of them. The ones we've seen on the streets driving those cams, those cameras, those either dash cams or people have filmed it on their phone. They're always very short clips, and uh, and it looks amazing. But it, there's no doubt they do drive these semi trucks out to areas and let people climb in and clamber all over them and, and and have a play. So we know the ones that are out there are the real deal. They're not just kind of show things. But I've not heard of any more than the three that are that are out there. So maybe they are starting to put them into production. Maybe the end by the end of the year there'll be twenty, thirty, or fifty of these things um, flying around with uh, with Tesla duties. Uh, to do certainly no customer deliveries for uh, for a long time yet. But as you say, I'm re I'm absolutely fascinated to to get these out there and to get them on the road because I do think they they capture people's imagination in a way that we've just talked about, Nicola. I think hydrogen captures people's imagination. It's always five or ten years away, but for the, for the last twenty years we've been saying oh, it's five years away because it does it does it's a it's a bit of a kind of a fairy tale thing. This whole kind of driving electric trucks on you know clean green power doing hundreds of miles but if they can deliver the specs which we showed a minute ago on you know on screen there's the you know, there's the specs very quick with a full load uh you know after 20 seconds to to get to top speed whatever that is it's just really it's a really compelling case uh we, we just hope they get to to do it as soon as possible yeah yes uh, start, starts on the semi tom yeah well you know I think the, the zero to 60 time is, you know, it's fun for people to read, but the, you know, fleet owners and managers really don't care about that. They like that midway down on the list that you had up there where it says fuel savings. That's right. the big, that, that that's really one of the most, only important metrics on that list there. I mean, you know, the, the range is obviously, but um, fuel savings is where it's at when you're talking trucks and fleet managers. And, you know, we've, been, we've all been um, anxiously awaiting this for a while now. Uh, you know, as the other guys have mentioned, we, we still don't know where exactly it's going to be made. Uh, so, you know, until, until we get more details than that, it's, I think it's more of an a Elon uh, knee-jerk reaction to, uh, you know, Nikola stealing the uh, headlines on, uh, with semis. I mean, I, I live here in New Jersey, and I'm unfortunately a, a Mets fan. You can see there's a behind me here, a Mets glass on the counter, uh, you know, always the stepchild to the Yankees. And in the 70s and 80s, George Steinbrenner, um, famous, you know, owner of the Yankees, 
if the Mets did anything, if they were on the news for anything, Steinbrenner had to dominate the news the next day. He'd fire a manager or he'd, 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 he'd go pay twice as much for a free agent um, because, you know, it was his ego and he, he had to be in the news. I think we have a little of that with Elon now with, with this, you know, everyone was talking about Nicola, the stock, you know, went crazy. And so, you know, Elon's just like, mm, well, well, we'll put ours into production now. So um, let me shoot out an email. Okay, guys, it's time to get the tr the semi out. So I think a little of that was going on. Um, you know, we going back to the other point about Tesla that you mentioned, Dom, when we started this was Model Y delays. Um, I'd love to pile on Tesla um, with, with manufacturing because it seems like they always have issues with new cars. And at some point, they have to stop having issues with their new cars and grow up and just launch cars and be able to make tens of thousands of them like all the regular uh, entrenched uh, OEMs can. Um, but I can't really pile on them this time because of COVID. Uh, you know, they're, they're, the supply chains are, are, are strangled right now. And, uh, you know, if, if they're having issues getting parts, it's it's understandable. So, you know, I kind of have to give them a pass on the Model Y. Yeah, they're not they're not able to scale up as quickly as as they like to um, due to these um, supply chain issues. But I mean, I mean, look what's going on in the world right now. We can't we really can't blame them for that, in my opinion. Yeah. And plus, um it's it's already the, the model Y program is already early. I I don't think I was I wasn't really expecting to see it until like later this year, and it was like early this year. It's that's a huge difference. So, you know, yeah, Tesla gets a lot of flack for um, being slow or being late with programs, but you know, mm. sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're early. This was early. The the Gigafactory in Shanghai went up within a year, like a record time. Uh, the Gigafactory in in uh, Berlin is uh, we have some we we have regular articles on that on Inside EVs, man. There it's it's going pretty quickly considering the you know the kind of red tape environment of the EU. So yeah, do you uh, guys think that there is less? Just posing a question that there is a significant uh, lower demand for Model Y. Uh, than other products. For example, if this production delay that they literally haven't delivered Model Y for months now and they just started to, if mm. this happened during Model 3 ramp up, imagine the posts and the comments we'd get everywhere. But honestly, I've not heard anything about Model Y. No one's heard anything. Well, I mean, I think do, are people even going to buy this thing when they can ramp production? You know, after COVID, are they going to be able to? You know, what's, mm. what's it going to look like? I don't know. Yeah, we don't have the same kind of feel for the demand like we had with the Model 3, and we didn't. And Elon hasn't really hyped expectations like he did with the Model 3. It's like the, when the Model 3 first came out, he had, he threw out some crazy number, like half a million or something by the end of the year they'll be producing, and, and it ended up being like a couple thousand or something. It was, it was really bad, you know. So I think he's learned from that and didn't set some like crazy expectations for the Model Y. But yeah, there still is a, like a, a lack of drama about demand. Like, yeah, no one I seems mean, to care that they have to wait because I don't think there's many people waiting. I think we'll just see them sitting on lots for immediate delivery soon. We already saw that actually. From the initial first batch, there were cars that were canceled when COVID first broke out and sure. they shut the factory down. And then for weeks, there were Model Y just sitting at Tesla, waiting for someone to place an order for it. And then those cars turned into test drive cars. So now you can go and test drive a Y. But this oh. is a, a very odd thing to see it this early on in the car. It has me sort of worried, actually, because the Model Y is a great car. I've spent a lot of time with it. I love it. I think it's the best Tesla ever made. But why aren't people interested? I don't worry about too much about cars and parking lots because you don't know if they're, they're staged for like a – the Japanese market or the European market or, or something, you don't, it's hard to say why they're in the parking lot. You know, there could be, there could be a number of valid reasons for them to be sitting there and not on trucks going to customers who are waiting. But uh, yeah, it's hard to get an idea of the a feel for the demand like we did with the model three. But that's partly that's because it's been the least hyped, as you mentioned, right. launch of anything, but even deliveries, like, we were sure of one thing. There's going to be a delivery party. Like, I know after Cybertruck, Elon said, no more big... Hope you've enjoyed it. Had a good night. We won't see you for a while. There's going to be no more big events. Um, we've gone through a series of product launches, um, and, uh, and, and everybody knew that there was going to be no new product launches, but we all kind of came away from the Cybertruck launch going, well, the, the next time there'll be a, a thing, a Tesla event, 
is Model Y deliveries, even if it's like a delivery day or some sort of celebration. There was no doubt that was going to happen. That didn't happen. It was literally a series of blogs or rumors or, you know, we were picking up at Inside EVs. Hang on, this, this customer just got delivered a car. Elon was really quiet and there's so little hype about it. At the time we speculated is that because they don't want to destroy Model 3 production lines mm. like they're they're up and running they know what they're doing they're good at making model threes now and as kyle said the model y is arguably for many people a much better car to buy so were they so terrified of destroying demand for three they didn't hype it and in doing that created this kind of lull around model y it's really we just don't get any anything to, to, to feed off of with the why, and that's where rumours start. And so I've seen a few articles recently of, 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 of people saying, oh, there must be a, a massive demand problem. And I don't know if I'd subscribe to that, but it's certainly I do get a little bit worried because the why is so good. Like, it is the best car they've made so far. It's the best electric car all around, I think, currently on the market. Yeah, I think this, the Cybertruck has stolen some of its thunder. Even with the Cybertruck, there's like a lot more anticipation. When we have an idea of, of demand, there's like, a, I think, 600,000 reservations, I think, the last time uh, I checked. Yeah, I hear from people, they go, like, I've, I've ordered one, I've ordered one. And I, you, you haven't ordered one. Right, you put $100 <laughs> you know, you, down. <laughs> you put $100 to reserve one. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? you, say you've ordered one. That's what they did. They yeah. put $100 down. I own a Tesla. <laughs> I've, I've ordered a Cybertruck. You haven't. Um, but they're so excited. People are so excited about that that Model Y, I don't know. I don't want to say falling through. It seems to be falling through the cracks of people's attention. But it, it, in a way, it is. Yeah, and look at the videos. They're not performing as well as Model 3 videos did when it came out. And partially is because a lot of the technology is similar to 3. Right. right. I think Monroe's teardown series was amazing on why that did really well, but that was really the first true series on why that has captured attention throughout. Um, I look at I one Tesla's YouTube channel, an amazing channel has a model. Y, is modifying it, doing really cool things. It will get big soon because he's doing some wild stuff with it, but the general captivity of the market isn't there for that kind of stuff that I'm seeing. And it, it's probably just because it's so similar to model three. People are like, we already know this. But the, I, I don't think it is similar to Model 3. When you look at Monroe's, it's it's so much better. Admittedly, Monroe was comparing it to a very early oh, 3. Right. So, yeah. so we don't know what's in a 3. But even things like the heat pump and the, the, the uh, octo valve and all the things that they... The, the, there are so many genuine reasons to be excited about the Model Y. It's so different from the 3 that this whole kind of nonsense thing that started that it's 75 percent the same as the as the three it's just basically a slightly bigger one it's all the same everything is different in the Y. the way it's wired all of these things huge improvements are made but we it somehow got lost in ah it's the same car it's the same don't worry about it same car as the three bit bigger it's not so, tom what do you think about this well i think you know martin i think the difference is yes it technically it's a lot different but not visually and not what the people see and feel in the vehicle. So, you know, uh, the average, you know, Joe Schmo buyer doesn't really understand octo valves and, and the, 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 the dramatic improvements that, that Tesla has made. I mean, I, you know, I love my model three and after watching the, the Sandy's videos, I actually, you know, for a brief moment said to myself, Hmm, should I just trade this thing in and get a Y? Cause it's, it's actually technically, so much superior to my car. Um, but, um, you know, I've, I've, I've decided, well, at least for today, I've decided against doing that. We'll see what happens when I wake up tomorrow. But I, for the average person, I, I don't think they see that much of a difference. And I think that's why we don't have that excitement uh, over, over the why like we did over the three. That it, it is very close on the surface. You have to dig, but when you dig, it's a lot. Uh, uh, they made improvements all around. I mean, even even the the sun the the, the sun visors, which is is a little bit of a sticky point for me. I I, I actually wrote a post on Inside EVs about how my sun visors cracked. The uh, the little plastic tab that mm -hmm. holds it is is very poorly made and designed. And I think over time, everybody that has a Model Three is going to have broken sun visor clips. And I think Tesla realized that. So they changed the sun visor clip. Now it's magnetic, which is actually brilliant. I, I don't know why anybody else hasn't come up with that yet. 
where you, you, you slide the sun visor over and it just kind of draws it in and connects it and the magnet holds it in place. You don't have to pop it into a clip that invariably either breaks over time or loosens up where the, where the, the, the visor will flap in and out. The magnet just grabs it. You just have to get close to it and it sucks it up and, and attaches. So, you know, Tesla realized all the, the little, the big issues like heat pump, but little issues like sun visor clips and improved it for the Y. So yeah, it's, it's a much improved vehicle, but I think the average person just says, look, it's a model three. That's a little bit taller and is a hatchback. So, um, hmm, you know, hmm. no big, no big news, but that cyber truck. Oh, that's something. <laughs> that, now, now we're talking. So, you know. so, so speaking about exciting crossovers that plug in, uh, the Ford Escape uh, uh, plug-in hybrid, FEV, I think they call it Ford Escape FEV. Uh, the price and range for the U.S. has been released. So um, I can see how excited you all are about this. But uh, So, yeah, that's going to be under $35,000, and it'll have an all-electric range of 37 miles. Uh, it has like a 14.4 kilowatt hour battery in it. And so I think, yeah, here we call it the Cougar here. K U G A. Cougar. I was trying to think about that. What yeah. a good Cougar. 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 And uh, it's got a slightly lower dub WLTP. The European test cycle is 31 miles. Um, oh, really? But otherwise on, on EPA, it's, it's as near as uh, the Prius, uh, no, the RAV4 uh, Prime that we were talking about last week. Um, right. It's within, within a few. And that's weird because I've seen, I think the, the Toyota site this week said now it's 38 or 39 miles, and last week we were saying 41, 42 in the press release. But, That's right. Uh, I remember so, over 40. Yeah, uh, and now the Toyota website is now, it's like it's late 30s for some reason. Uh, it says WLTP or HPA? EPA. It's, it's really weird. In the US, oh, really? there's two numbers. Just this week, it's floating around, and I remember it because we talked about it that psychological 40 barrier but basically you know same mileage uh, with this uh, with this uh, with the you know cougar the escape and very very compelling as we said last week about the toyota a if you want this car it offers a very compelling solution to a lot of running around doing your jobs all electric get your errands and your chores done uh, even your commute 5 days a week never having to touch the engine at all. Uh, once again, it's it seems to be a bit of a sweet spot for plug-in hybrids at the minute. Yeah, I think there's two uh, key metrics that a plug-in hybrid needs to hit to make it a usable plug-in hybrid. Uh, one, it needs to have normal, if not brisk, acceleration in electric mode. Because, for example, I had the Volvo V60 plug-in hybrid a few weeks ago. Love the car. You know, I I read a whole article. I was in love with it. But you could not drive normally accelerating onto the highway without kicking on the internal combustion engine. Therefore, psychologically to me, all the benefits of electric have gone. Then you're just using the plug-in bit for boost. So it needs to have brisk acceleration. The Prius Prime that I had last week did everything perfectly fine in electric mode. I was impressed with that. The other thing is significant range. I think 35, 40 miles is probably true. And I think BMW Group just said all future plug-in hybrids will have 100 kilometers of range, 62 miles WLTP. And for whatever reason, WLTP and EPA rates plug-in hybrids differently than they do electric vehicles. And I'm not sure how that all works out, um, but I've been able to easily blow past every EPA rated plug-in hybrid range in electric mode in a plug-in hybrid. The Prius, I went like six miles past. The Volvo, I went three or four miles past. And I was like driving normally. Tom, do you know how they rate the range of plug-in hybrids? Yeah, I think the big difference is, in my opinion, in these two vehicles, Besides the range, yeah, the Ford's got a slightly smaller battery than the RAV4. Uh, the fact that the RAV4 is all-wheel drive, I think that's a, a really big thing here. Um, you know, I, so many – over the years, I've had so many um, people reach out to me and say, when are we going to have like a small all-wheel mm -hmm. drive? And people have even said, you know, RAV4 type of a, of a, of a, of a vehicle. Um, you know, sure, the Model Y kind of fits in that wheelhouse, but the the – the RAV4 is more SUV-ish, and, and I think a lot of people are looking for that. So, you know, while I, I, I like the Ford, I think it's a good good vehicle. Um, I think that for me, you know, I hate to say it because we talked about this last last week on, on the show that I'm not a huge fan of Toyota at this moment. I just think the, the RAV4, even though it's mo more expensive, um, has a lot more to offer. It's got more electric range. It's, it's much more powerful. 
Um, and it's got that all wheel drive that so many people are interested in, at least the Northeast states here where I, where I live. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's such an advantage. Yeah. I, I think that the, the RAV4 is a, is a much more car and it's worth the money based off of specs alone. Um, but I hope the all wheel drive system, and I honestly haven't researched it yet, but I hope the all wheel drive system is different than the Prius e all-wheel drive because I, this is something i want to talk about the prius e all-wheel drive only sends seven horsepower to the rear axle and tfl car did a little rolly wheel test thing and it couldn't it basically did nothing and so they badged the car as all-wheel drive but seven horsepower couldn't do anything when the wheels were slipping on rollers i thought it was so funny well the um the RAV4, I believe, has an electric motor on the back axle. So when you're in EV mode only, we had somebody asking this in the forum, in, in, the, in the RAV4 section of the forum. Um, so if you're just running on battery only, it, can you get all-wheel drive? Or are you stuck just on the back axle? I'm not really sure. It does use the same um, all-wheel drive system as the plug-in hybrid version of the RAV4, which I'm not... Super- uh, as I'm mean, sorry, as the uh, as a hybrid version of the Rav4, which I'm not familiar with. But, yeah, 134 uh, kilowatt motor on the front and 40 kilowatt motor on the rear axle. Well, that's enough to get you out of. It's not seven horsepower. <laughs> it's better than that. So there's an electric motor on the front as well as the back. I was thinking mm. it was only the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're already deep into the show here. So I just want to hit a couple things before we uh, close out. Um, the Ford F-150 electric pickup truck is uh, now coming within 24 months by mid-2022. And they'll also, in 2022, launch the all-electric transit. So I'm not sure. That might be a little, little bit of, of a delay for the electric pickup truck from Ford, which you said people were pretty excited about there the other day, Kyle. Internally, their commercial electric vehicle programs, so their trucks, their vans, their stuff, they were like, look, if we could, if we had to tell you, we'd have to kill you uh, type thing. But they're like, these are going to be badass. So I'm excited for that. Uh, I, I just think that that is the biggest gap right now is fleet vehicles being electrified. Why do we keep targeting consumers at a one person basis when you can sell 30 or 40 battery electric vehicles at a time to a fleet? with vans and cool stuff. And granted, there's some small companies doing this, but they haven't cracked the code. They can't get the scale of manufacturing big enough to make the cost low enough. And so I think Ford may be able to you know, take their weight of the company, mass produce some things, and really change the way that small businesses operate with you know a, a 20 to 40 scale fleet uh, size company. We've been seeing Electrified Garage, for example, outfitting fleet vehicles with plug-in hybrid systems. So they'll take an F-150, throw a battery pack in the back with a J1772 plug, and now they can have extended idling times, extra performance, and electric driving. So companies are want this, and it's pretty much free with tax and, and government incentives to do this upgrade to their trucks. So you know, nice. I just think this is a big missing market here for F-150 and Transit Connect. Well, to your point about commercial vehicles in, in the pickup space, uh, Lordstown Motor has uh, just announced actually that, this, that they'll be show, unveiling their endurance pickup truck uh, during the second of the week, that was the week of June 22nd. So I think that's a Monday. I, I would be surprised if we don't see it by, by Thursday of that week. That's just a couple of weeks from now. And that's this is you can see it on the screen there if you're watching on YouTube. That's the one with the Elaf, uh, Elaf, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, I don't know. In, it has in-wheel motors, and they're going to be produ- producing those at the uh, the Lordstown facility. It used to be a GM factory, and they're working on on building that out now, and they expect to have some amount of production uh, starting in December of this year with some pre-production. They're, they're originally going to have deliveries of this endurance pickup truck in December, but now they've moved to, I think, January. So not, not a huge delay there. And it's like a $52,000, so $45,000 after the federal tax credit. It's a 600 horsepower, maybe more than 200 miles of range on the endurance. And that's like we said, I think that's a fleet vehicle. And it's, they have the amount of pre orders is kind of small. I think it was like uh, five, 20,000, 5,000. It wasn't, it's in the low thousands. It, there's, it's not crazy like the, uh, like the cyber truck by any means but this is a, a brand new company and and their focus is on fleet so yeah it's a little bit of a different thing uh, 
Yeah, so other news that we wanted to hit really quick before we moved on. Does anyone have anything to say about the uh, Lordstown Motor Endurance? Looks nice. It'd be interesting to see with the, with the sheet off of it. So the other big thing, I think, was the uh, Volkswagen ID3, which isn't coming to the U.S. that we know as of yet. But it's gonna, it should be big in Europe, and it's an important car for Volkswagen. Um, it's coming out now at the end of summer. Originally, they were just saying deliveries begin in the summer of 2020. So that now they're saying end of summer. So technically, they can kind of claim that it's not late, but, you know, it, it's late, <laughs> I think. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been, I've been having this debate this week. Do they ship the car incomplete? For viewers that are right. listeners that, that, that aren't quite sure, uh, they've been uh, plagued by some software issues. And um, do they ship the car now or on time in September? Because the official end of summer is something like the second week of September. So they can just about do it and, and, uh, and not be cheating. Uh, do they ship the car now? Hold their head up. Say they were on time. Or just wait and, and ship the car when the software is complete. None of them are, you know, uh, make or break features of the software. But it's it's really hard. Like Tesla can uh, is is autopilot still badged as beta? I don't know. I don't drive one. But yes, like you know, they can they can do stuff and be like, oh, we tried it, didn't work. And uh, uh, you know, oh, we tried battery swapping. That oh, didn't work. No one used it. We closed it. Imagine if VW were like battery swapping is the future, and then they built a station, and then no one used it. They'd be crucified. It's really hard for VW, the size, the history, what they've done, the way they've behaved, to to win with this. Because I don't know if they ship their cars and they're not right, they're just going to get reviewed on YouTube and and magazines and lose. Blues. Well, they're yeah, giving, it's, it, that's exactly the phrase. They're giving their customers two options. So, option one, you can uh, you can get it at the end of summer, and what's the thing here? Uh, so you'll be part of the first mover club, and but it'll come without. It'll be missing two outstanding digital functions: the app connect function and the distance feature in the heads up display. So, which actually, that to me sounds like pretty small things. Yeah, I mean that doesn't that shouldn't affect anything. They I don't even know why they're making it a big deal. It's just like here's your car. Right. By the way, in a few weeks it's going to get better. Have a good one. Enjoy it. Just, ex yeah. just say that. Just yeah. say that. Just yeah, I think you're hired, Kyle. Thank you. <laughs> VW's new communications director. <laughs> Take right. your damn ID threes out of our parking lot, and we'll fix them later. Yeah, <laughs> like Tesla can get away with that. Can VW? Can VW ship a car, Martin? That isn't complete and say, oh, by the way, um, give us a few months. You know, I, I don't know. That's that's not how business has been done. You know, and uh, it, it'd be interesting to see if they do that, how people react. Tesla gets away with stuff that nobody else can. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, I personally, I wouldn't mind. So in that in that regard, you know, maybe they can get away with it. But I'm not the average, you know, automobile consumer, especially in this EV space. Can, would the... Uh, you know, would the average customer in Europe, Martin, accept that? Well, I mean, they, they were saying that they predict like 5 or 10% of those people who put the money down to get a reservation are going to drop out. So that's a pretty good retention rate. So that's, uh, you know, what you're left with is a reasonably engaged, hardcore, EV-forward enthusiasts who I think would forgive them. I think the actual people who get the cars would forgive them for it but the difficulty they've got is that wider narrative of as you say mainstream media but also it just like, like we're, we're talking about it now we're, the car isn't even on the road and we're saying oh big software problems none and none of us have experienced it for ourselves so it's oh man it's a it's a tough situation would the people who have put their money down to get the car mind no i don't reckon they would they'd just be so proud of being on the road in this great car and uh, and then a great it, car. I mean, it gets, a, it gets better a few weeks later. The actual people who get the car wouldn't mind. It's just a much bigger news story than it deserves to be. Agreed. The, the, the second option, when you choose the second option, you'll get delivery in 2020. So the, the fourth, they, they've nailed down, nailed, nailed it down to the fourth quarter, which is you know, so say November, December, you'll have a car. And just to give a, a quick overview of the i3, if you're not familiar with it, it's got like a 58, 62 kilowatt hour battery. That's a net in total. Um, zero to 60 is in 3.4 seconds and it's rear wheel drive. That's very quick. 
It's rear wheel drive, it's a 150 kilowatt motor, lots of torque. Um, DC fast charging is up to 100 kilowatts and it's got an 11 kilowatt onboard charger, which is very fast. So at home, it'll, it'll charge up quickly too if you have a, the circuits to, to back up an 11 kilowatt charger. Does that take a big, uh, a lot of amps for that? Uh, no, uh, well, that's three phase. So that that's yeah. less than 32 amps. That's uh, normally you can do 22 kilowatt three phase at 32 amp, right, Tom? Yeah, so that's um, you know it's it's what, what what a lot of our readers, a lot of our followers understand, but a lot don't is that the European power is based on three phase. We don't have that here in the uh, U.S. except it's unless it's uh, commercial. So when we talk about eleven kilowatts here in the U.S., we're talking about a forty amp circuit. But in Europe, it's not forty amps. It's it's what isn't that sixteen amps, Mark? Yeah, it's sixteen yeah. or twenty something. Yeah, more, yeah a so lot of places over here, yeah, three uh, three phase. Yeah, power is different. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and, then, and then particularly, it's good to have that, that onboard charging as well. So there's many like countries like France have built a load of 22 kilowatt AC posts, for right. instance, because uh, the Zoe is so popular in, you know, in France, uh, domestic car. And so it is very important to have a, a fast onboard charger if you are destination charging. So it's an it's a pretty important feature to have, you know, quick, quick charging. But I like the ID3. I, Tom, you probably have seen it too, but I played around with it in Frankfurt and it seems to be the right size. It's funky. It's trendy. It's cool. I love the play and pause button on the pedal. I would definitely <laughs> get that. And like, you know, there's a lot of Volkswagen enthusiasts that want the car. I just think, you know, like you had mentioned this whole story, it's basically like, do you want to not drive your car for two months? And then we'll give it to you with an app, or you could just drive it now without an app for a couple months and then just we'll add it later. Why would you not want the car? I don't get that. I mean, they're, they're sitting there, right? They've been making them since last year. They're sitting <laughs> in parking lots and they just, you know what really it probably is, is they just don't have the manpower to plug in and update these things over and over. There's hundreds and, and probably thousands, thousands of cars that need to be plugged in and physically updated because I don't believe that they're able to be over the air software updated with the current software version on there. Right. I, I think that is the main issue. They will be able to eventually, though, right? Yes, but I think you have you probably have to go to a service center for this app update. And once you get that app functionality, then the cars are connected. And I think that's probably the big disconnect here. Correct. All right. Well, come on, Volkswagen, ship us some cars, man. We need them. All right, so that uh, that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments on any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post or in the comments in the YouTube video here below or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. Uh, don't forget, you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Uh, Tom is at Tomalog. Uh, Martin is at EV News Daily. Kyle is at Out of Spec. I'm Dominic underscore Y. Clip, uh, <laughs> click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Ciao. Bye-bye.